Okay, so let's continue our um, discussion on renormalization and today I'm going to show you how to get rid of infinities that you get in Feynman diagrams. Okay, so let's quickly summarize what we have been doing so far. Um, so, okay, so we are interested in the FIFO theory whose action is the following and this is in four dimensions. Okay, um, let me reduce a bit, brush palette. Yeah. Okay, and then as you know that because we have divergences, um, sorry, because our integrals were uh, not defined in four dimensions, we decided to do analytic continuation. Two d dimensions, which for which uh, I mean, which we are taking to be four minus two epsilon. Okay, dimensions. So the action with which we will work is this four minus two epsilon. And then we have half del mu phi, del mu phi minus half m square phi square minus lambda over 4 factorial mu to the 2 epsilon phi to the 4. Okay, and as you recall, the reason why we have mu to the 2 epsilon here is because the coupling constant becomes dimension full as you go to d dimensions. So in order to have the dimension uh, dimensionless coupling, I have pulled out a scale mu and I have raised to the power 2 epsilon. So mu is a fixed scale. You, you decide on a mu and then you proceed. Okay. Otherwise you would have had uh, lambda times mu epsilon as um, some let's call lambda d some D dimensional, I mean, a coupling constant in D dimensions, which would be dimension full. So instead of working with lambda times mu epsilon, mu to the two epsilon, you could have worked directly with this, but this would have been then dimension full. Okay. So also you should note that you don't have uh, three parameters. You have only two parameters, m and lambda. Mu you fix. Right, that's not something, so, so because see lambda d is one parameter, okay. Splitting that lambda d into two factors doesn't make two parameters, okay. You cannot, I mean, if you could, then you could have also split into 10 other factors and said that you have 10 parameters, which makes no sense. So you really have two parameters, m and lambda, and clearly your results should not depend on the choice of mu. Okay, because you are going to vary only lambda. Okay. Another way also, when you go to lambda going to zero, uh, sorry, epsilon going to zero limit, there is no mu because this epsilon will drop out. Uh, sorry, this epsilon goes to zero and this mu to the two epsilon will drop out. So in four dimensions, when you go back, again you see there is no mu. Okay. But we will see that even though uh, results should not depend on mu, um, uh, the, the the physical observable should not depend on mu, um, but when we calculate, we are going to see dependence on mu. Okay, uh, we'll make more remarks about that later. But this is something that is going to happen. Okay, and um, some notation now. These phi's, the fields that appear here, the field phi the parameter m and the parameter lambda, these are called bare parameters. 
or bare fields. So this one is a bare bare field. This is bare mass parameter and this is bare coupling constant. Okay. Then we did the following. We wrote the same action as so I'm putting equal to so it's the same as it's not something different as as 4 minus 2 epsilon d to the 4 minus okay I forgot x here um, then we redefined fields okay we said that okay the bare uh, field is z phi to the half and then phi renormalized and similarly, um, bare coupling, uh, sorry, bare mass is Zm times um, M renormalized and lambda, the bare coupling constant is Z lambda times lambda renormalized, okay, where the Z start at order 1. this is small z, lowercase z, okay, and these z i's start at order lambda, lambda r, okay. These fields phi, m r and lambda r, we will keep them finite, okay, that is something we demand and you are going to see that the fields phi, m and lambda will become infinite, okay, and all that infinity will be uh, contained in the z phi's, z m's and z lambda. But let's anyway progress uh, and see explicitly that this is what happens. So uh, with these definitions, we wrote the same action, okay, not changing the theory, it's the same theory, we wrote as um, half z phi del mu phi r del mu phi r minus half z m square z phi m r square phi r square. Okay. All I am doing is substituting these definitions in this section here. Okay, and that is what gives you this thing. And then minus lambda r over 4 factorial mu to the 2 epsilon z lambda z phi square phi r square okay and then i added and subtracted the 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 terms which you get in the action here okay but phi and m and lambda replaced by phi r m r and lambda r, okay because this is uh, these are the ones which were originally there Right, so I just want to have Feynman rules which are, uh, which the Feynman rules contain the set of Feynman rules which I already had. That is what I want to ensure. So I just add and subtract this term, okay, with the fields and parameters replaced by renormalized fields and renormalized parameters. So the same action I rewrote as d4 minus 2 epsilon x and half del mu phi r del mu phi r minus half m r square phi r square remember m r has the mass dimension one okay so that is why there was no need of any um, any additional mass scale and then we had lambda r over four factorial mu to the two epsilon phi r to the 4. So I added this and then I subtract it uh, and I get this um, plus um, let me start from here plus half z phi minus 1 del mu phi r del mu phi r 
माइनस हाफ जेड फाइव जेड एम स्क्वायर माइनस वन एम आर स्क्वायर फाइव आर स्क्वायर माइनस लेमडा आर ओवर फोर फैक्टोरियल म्यू टू द टू एप्सल इन जेड लेमडा जेड फाइव स्क्वायर माइनस वन फाइव आर टू द फोर ओके इज द अगेन द सेम एक्शन एज बिफोर but written slightly differently okay these the first line okay that's what we had in the original action with the replacement of the fields and parameters the second line is uh new and these are called counter terms okay so all the terms in here are called counter terms okay remember i have not put any additional terms as you as you know okay but still i am calling these as counter terms and this as the original thing because it looks like what you had originally even though the fields have been rescaled and uh, mass parameter and uh, coupling constant has been rescaled okay so that's just a way of uh, saying that what we have here is counter term okay and you will see what it is going to counter okay so and then we had the feynman rules momentum space feynman rules so the propagator is i over p square minus mr square plus i epsilon right because this is what is going to provide you with the propagator and that is the mr here so that is mr square plus i epsilon okay then as earlier you have this vertex which gives you a factor of minus i lambda over 4 factorial okay and then you have a two point vertex okay and remember i call this is a vertex because z minus 1 is of order lambda r okay so this term comes with the order lambda r and this has two fields phi okay so it will have two external two uh, two legs so this vertex just like this vertex has four legs because you have four fields here okay if you go back and see how we derived feynman rules uh why this has four legs you will see that for the same reason this has two legs okay just a second okay and this um you should see that in the in the fourier space this will give you the following the moment of space feynman rule is the following okay and we also had the vertex coming from this one okay this has four legs and this also starts at order lambda r right because z lambda is of order 1 uh, sorry z lambda is 1 plus order lambda z phi square is 1 plus order lambda okay so when you subtract 1 it will give you a term which is of order lambda okay the same is true for this one and and this one all, all these terms so when i wrote this this one i have included both of these here and now i am writing this one again to remind that this is coming from a counter term i have put this circle here and the feynman rule is the following okay, just like you had minus i lambda over 4 factorial here you have the same thing here okay i have missed the mu to the 2 epsilon mu to the 2 epsilon z lambda z phi square minus 1 okay so since this factor is of order lambda r you already have an explicit order uh, explicit factor of lambda r this vertex 
or this term is of order lambda r square and that is why this vertex is of order lambda r square. Okay, so it's one order higher compared to this vertex and this vertex. These are all, all of order lambda r. Okay, and remember when we do perturbation theory, we have to um, uh, do things order by order in the parameter lambda r. Right, because lambda r is our expansion parameter. Okay, we are organizing the perturbation theory using the parameter lambda r. Okay, so uh, a term which is of order lambda r square, okay, is a higher order term compared to an order lambda r term. Okay, so if you want to get a result which is correct only up to order lambda r, you do not have to worry about terms that appear at order lambda r square. Okay. So, uh, as of now, I have not really done anything. I have just renamed things. Beyond that, I have not done any, anything. Okay. Now, let's go and try to calculate some um, physical thing in, in the theory. And in the same theory, there is nothing. It's not a new theory. It's the same theory. And let's um, try to figure out the physical mass. Okay. That's one thing one would like to know what are the physical masses of the particles okay and that is something i want to calculate so what you should um, notice that i will choose some value of mr some value of lambda r some value of mu okay these will be fixed so they are inputs okay or choices and then i ask if i have made these choices then what is the physical mass that I get? And of course, that physical mass will depend on these, these choices, right? MR and lambda R. Uh, let's see then how to get it and what we get. So, Okay, physical mass is something that you can observe, right, in an experiment. Like you can find out what is the mass of an electron or what is the mass of, a, of um, any other particle. Recently, uh, I mean, one of the fundamental particles which was uh, discovered most recently is the Higgs boson. Okay, so what is the mass of the Higgs boson that you find from experiment? Okay, if you are aware of the story of it, um, people were searching for a for a peak in the diboson uh, diphoton uh, channel okay because you it's one of the easiest ways of finding it so you look at uh, two photons in the final state okay the photons are usually denoted by curvy lines okay and um, you have two protons colliding so this is I'm denoting proton okay they they collide at LHC okay and then of course many processes happen and you let's say are looking at a process in which you get two photons okay and you construct the invariant mass of these photons so if you have this one has momentum p1 and this one has p2 then p1 plus p2 whole square that is what is called as invariant mass okay and people found a peak in that invariant mass okay, at some energy so from there you find out what is the Higgs mass okay because this will give you the uh, this is invariant mass square okay, this has dimensions of energy squared or mass squared so this is invariant mass squared and from this you find out what is the mass of the Higgs boson, okay? That is how it was done. Now, that mass of the Higgs boson is something physical, okay? Irrespective of what theory you have, what m uh, r and lambda r, etc., you are choosing, okay? It doesn't care about those things. It's an experimental outcome. So, you find that. Now, once you have found mp, okay, or uh, some number of observables you have found, uh, uh, um, observed in the experiments okay 
then you can using those values for the physical mass or whatever else you have calculated okay you can try to fit what mr and lambda r would be okay so that is how you can determine the values of mr and lambda r and then if you have a new observable for which you want a prediction then to calculate that new observable you can feed in the values of mr and lambda r okay and that is how this this works so first let us calculate uh physical mass mp assuming that some uh, observations have given us what the values of mr and lambda r should be okay so some observables have been uh, observed in the experiment okay they have been measured okay once these observables have been measured uh, one uh, feeds in some values of mr and lambda r okay and try to see which values of mr and lambda r reproduce those um uh, observed results okay and then you use those mr and lambda r to calculate mp okay or any other observables so that is how you should think about it okay so let's calculate mp and you know how to get this so you look at the two point function okay and look at the pole of it okay pole of the propagator so this is this plus this plus this okay why you what we are doing here is we are writing down this two point function up to order lambda r okay that's what we are doing so i should have order lambda r to the zero term an order lambda r term but no order lambda r square term they are not needed so this is the order lambda r to the zero term okay there is no lambda r here so there's the first term plus you have uh, the self energy diagram okay one loop self energy diagram it has a factor of lambda r here so it contributes and this one you have seen this vertex itself is order lambda r okay so this also contributes at order lambda r okay now this is finite there's just the propagator i over p square minus mr square plus i epsilon okay so this is singular okay because of the uh uh loop uh, the loop diagram because it's a loop diagram it has ultra violet divergent okay and this has this expression as we wrote before okay this thing times these two propagators okay so um yeah okay good so remember now whenever you are writing any any green's function you have to always include the counter terms also uh that can appear up to that particular order up to which you are interested in okay so this you cannot say that okay this is the diagram this is also a diagram that contributes and you have to keep it okay this cannot be omitted okay yeah, because your your action now has such terms so they all have to be included okay so let's um calculate this just to be a little bit clearer this object is now Okay, Fourier transform of this. Okay, this is uh, how we had um, looked at this two-point function in the Fourier space, in the Feynman, uh, in the in the momentum space. Okay, so this is what I am looking at, where the fields are having this subscript R. Okay, these are correlators of renormalized fields. Okay, so let's look at. the first term the first term in the expansion is simply i over p square minus m square plus i epsilon okay this one has two factors of i over p square minus m square plus i epsilon 
right? One coming from this propagator, another coming from this propagator. So you have a square of it times this integral. Okay, so let's assign a loop momentum L. And this integral is, so let me first write down the vertex. It is minus I lambda over 4 factorial mu to the 2 epsilon. Okay, that is our vertex. Okay. Then I should write down the integral, the Feynman integral, which is d power 4 minus 2 epsilon d uh, L over 2 pi 4 minus 2 epsilon into I over L square minus MR square plus I epsilon. Okay. This, uh, this is because of this propagator. See, there is one propagator here, right? This, which carries momentum L. Okay. So that is what I'm writing. I over L square minus M square plus epsilon. Okay. Now I should also uh, multiply the combinatoric factor. So that's easy to find. You have um, here, this is this point I'm drawing. This is this side. And then you have a four point vertex. So this one can go to any of the four. Then this one can go to any of the three. I should have, there's nothing wrong in what I have done, but it's not very convenient. So it can go to any of the four. It can go to any of the three. And this can only connect this. So it is four times three. And then you have one over n factorial where that um, n uh, depends on the order of lambda, right? And because that is one, so it is one over one factorial. Okay, if uh, we were at two loops or two, uh, order lambda r square, it would have been one over two factorial. So this is the expression and um, also let me now write down this one, just a second. Okay. Now the counter term or counter vertex or counter diagram, better counter diagram. So this is what? Again, this has two uh, propagators, which each of which carries a momentum P. So you get I over P square minus M R square plus I epsilon. squared and then you have I I'm writing this vertex here this one I times half Z phi minus 1 P square where P square is the square of this momentum minus half Z phi Zm square minus 1 m r square okay now i should find out the combinatoric factor and what is that so let's do it here um you have again this and then you have a two point vertex okay. these sticks coming out are from the vertex, okay? They, these are not propagators and I have to connect these propagators. So this one can go to any of these two, this or that. Okay, let's say it goes here, one. Then this has only one option. So, which is same as this diagram, right? I'm just drawing it differently. It's the same diagram. So first one had two options. The second one had only one option. So you total two. <coughs> and again, one over one factorial, okay? So this is the contribution of this diagram. Okay, so um, 
so here lambda r let's check if everything is fine okay all looks good so far just one remark here look at this integral uh, uh, this this contribution the in the integral that you have here this one okay it's a bit special um, because it does not contain the external momentum p okay so you don't see p anywhere here but this is not a general feature uh, typically loop uh, moment uh, tip loop integrals will carry the external momenta it is just because uh, this loop is such that there is no external momenta that enters into it that is why this is completely dependent of p or p square okay but this is not generic this is something very special here so if you had a diagram of this kind then p will also enter into the loops okay and then the integral will also depend on p okay so um, i should now do what i should calculate this integral and substitute it in here to see what i get okay so um, let me first do that integral let's call it i so let's define this integral to be i i and it depends on what it depends on mr square and also on epsilon so let me also here write mr square epsilon this one let's be careful and write it like this okay so let's find out the loop integral we have already uh, done this let me just write the result here um integral d dl over 2 pi to the d 1 over l square minus mr square plus i epsilon to the n is i times minus 1 to the n over 4 pi d over 2 okay gamma of n minus d over 2 over gamma n and then you have 1 over mr square minus i epsilon power n minus d over 2 okay so let's put n equal to 1 um Yeah, before i do that uh, the integral is not really this there is a factor of i also here okay because that's what comes from the propagator so let me include that i i will not write it here i'll write it outside so this is i capital i is this okay and then you have a factor of i also here okay so um i square gives you minus 1 capital n is 1 so there is a minus 1 here that cancels the sign which you get from i square okay so you have 1 over um 4 pi power 2 minus epsilon okay d over 2 is uh 2 minus epsilon then you have gamma of n is 1 minus d over 2 so what is 1 minus d over 2 One minus d is four minus two epsilon, so two minus two epsilon, uh, two minus epsilon. Okay, this is minus one plus epsilon. Or gamma of one. And this one is one over m r square. Now you see m r square is positive. Okay, so this is a fractional power of a positive number. okay so there is no issue i there is no issue of uh, knowing uh, th there is no uh, issue of uh, a branch cut appearing here and I, i and that i should know on which side of the cut i am okay so i can just drop this if it was negative then i have to worry okay so i'll just drop that i epsilon 
and this will be again n minus d over 2 is minus 1 plus epsilon okay also another uh, fact so you have gamma of n minus d over 2 right so because d has an epsilon and let's say we are not taking epsilon to be integer because we want it to take any arbitrary value so unless d unless uh, d is also integer such that n minus d over 2 is a negative integer okay the gamma is not not divergent see gamma is analytic for all values of uh, its arguments except for zero and negative integers okay so even though you are having a dimension d okay which is uh, let's say which will naively give you a singularity because the by the power counting it appears to have more powers in the numerator than the denominator even then it would not give a divergence gamma function will not be singular unless the the power that you have okay the the total power that you have d minus n is integer okay so these are analytic functions um, for all non integral values okay good so uh, we have this here and this i can write as um, i think i had already anyway nevertheless i should do it so we'll use gamma z gamma z is equal to gamma z plus 1 so minus 1 plus epsilon times gamma of minus 1 plus epsilon is gamma of epsilon okay so gamma of minus 1 plus epsilon is 1 over or minus 1 minus epsilon gamma of epsilon okay so i will write this as um, 1 over 4 pi 2 minus epsilon is that correct that's correct and then you have um, a minus sign 1 over gamma sorry 1 minus epsilon gamma of epsilon okay and this is mr square 1 minus epsilon okay so um, I'll massage it a little bit more good hmm. okay so this is uh, minus 1 over 4 pi square times um, mr square times um, um, mr square this is in the denominator sorry times um, 4 pi over mr square power epsilon okay and then you have gamma of epsilon over 1 minus epsilon okay that's the integral the, that's the value of the integral so what is the value of that f full Feynman diagram it is this and then um, yeah so there is a factor of minus i here there is a factor of minus 1 here and it will combine with this factor of uh, minus 1 here to give a plus okay and then um, I have lambda r over 4 factorial then you have mu square power epsilon okay mu, mu to the 2 epsilon which is mu square power epsilon 
that I will combine with where is that with this this factor okay so it will become 4 pi mu r square mu square over m r square power epsilon okay that is what it will give when you combine and then these factors okay so let me write down that uh, I have a I should have a factor of i okay so let me write and then check so I'll get i um, lambda r m r square um, there is a factor of half and then you have 4 pi square and there is factor of half okay let me show you so 4 times 3 and you have divided by 4 factorial so that gives a factor of half okay in the denominator uh, a factor of 2 in the denominator so that is the factor of half here okay 1 over 2 then um, yeah then I have taken care of lambda r and this factor of i okay lambda r and this factor of i and then I have pulled out m r square from the integral okay and this 4 pi square also I have already taken now I should write these factors including the mu, mu square to the epsilon so I have 4 pi mu square over m r square power epsilon then you have gamma of epsilon over 1 minus epsilon and m r square I have already taken here so let me check i over 2 lambda r m r square 4 pi square 4 pi mu square over m r square power epsilon gamma epsilon over 1 minus epsilon so that's correct that's the correct result okay now let's uh, look at the poles explicitly this piece here is a 1 plus epsilon times log of 4 pi mu square over m r square okay plus order epsilon square term okay just a second Sorry again, it should work. Okay. So this is this factor then you know what gamma of uh, 1 over 1 minus epsilon is this is 1 plus epsilon plus order epsilon square okay when I write order epsilon square it means all the terms including epsilon square and all the terms after epsilon square also okay because they are successively of lower lower uh, lower orders then you have gamma of epsilon which is 1 over epsilon minus Euler gamma that's that was the number I told you earlier plus order epsilon terms what does that give so in this product the most singular term will be produced when you multiply 1 over epsilon to the one here and to the one there okay when you pick out that term 1 times 1 times 1 over epsilon you get the most singular piece okay epsilon to the minus 1 
Now let's look at epsilon to the zero term. So there are several ways in which you can generate order epsilon to the zero term. So let's take minus gamma i here, which is order epsilon to the zero, multiply it with one here, okay, and that one there. So that gives you minus gamma i. Okay. Also, if you Yeah, so that is one source. If you multiply this one over epsilon with this epsilon, okay, the pole term uh, multiplying the order epsilon term gives a finite value, finite term, right? So this also that is why one has to be very careful in getting the finite uh, results. See, so getting singular part is fine. You can just drop all the order epsilon terms. There is no problem. But if you want to have the finite parts also correct, you have to expand sufficiently in the orders of epsilon depending on up to what loop you are working. So at one loop, this will be sufficient. So one by epsilon times epsilon gives you one. So that's um, um, plus one. Okay. Then also when you multiply this one over epsilon term with this epsilon term here, so one over epsilon, one from here and epsilon term here that also gives you a finite piece and which is log of 4 pi mu square over mr square okay Um, this is fine. And did I miss something? One over epsilon, other gamma, plus one. This is perfectly fine. So I will just bring it a little closer. This is what you get. Okay, plus order epsilon terms. I don't worry about order epsilon because now when I take epsilon going to zero, this will drop out and I have kept uh, correctly all the finite terms. Okay. I will rewrite it a little bit differently. I will write it as one over epsilon plus log of four pi. So that is log of four pi coming from here minus Euler gamma. that is here this term plus one plus log of mu square over mr square plus order epsilon. Okay, so that's the uh, result for this. Now, when I add this, I think it will be better if I write it again here. So this piece, what is that? Yeah, I lambda r over this vector. Um, let me write it. So let me change this. So 4 pi, 4 pi square is 16 pi square and there is a factor of 2 here that makes this 32. Okay, so 32 pi square. Okay, good. So that factor is there and then we have uh, all these poles. 1 over um, times 1 over epsilon plus log 4 pi minus Euler gamma 
plus log of mu square over mr square plus order epsilon terms. Let's check. Did I miss? No, I did not. Yes, I did miss one. Okay, plus one. Okay, and then uh, I should add to this the counter term and of course the pure propagator term also. And this was this this one the counter term provides you this. And what are the factors? Um, I'll write it here, half z5 minus 1 p square, okay, minus half z5 zm square minus 1 times mr square. Okay, so now I have uh, the sum of these two is equal to the sum of these two expressions on the top. Okay. Now I want the following. I want the sum to be finite. Okay. Because if the sum is finite, then the mass which I'm going to calculate at one loop up to order lambda r square, okay, the physical mass that will be finite. Okay, I'll, um, so first let me make the sum finite here. Okay, that's what is called renormalization. So I'm going to subtract infinities now. Okay, so let's look at this term. This is what you had gotten uh, if you had not um, um, split the Lagrangian the way we have. Okay, and just continued with the parameters lambda and m. If you had continued with the bare parameters uh, lambda and m, and uh, bare field phi, this is what you would have obtained. The only difference would be that instead of lambda r and mr, you would have lambda and m. Okay. But even after that, you, you you have used lambda r and mr, nothing has changed because it's still the same integral. Instead of lambda, you have lambda r. Instead of m, you have mr. Okay. But the advantage is now that you have also this term. But in this term, the z phi's and z m's are still at our disposal. There is nothing that fixes what Z phi should be and Z m should be. Okay, in the steps that we have done, there is nothing telling you what is the value of Z phi and what is the value of Z m. Okay, so what we can do is we can choose the values of Z phi and Z m such that they cancel the singularities that are present in this expression in the in the loop diagram. Okay, so what I should do is make. Uh, to make this finite, I make the following choice. First, let's look at if there is any singularity in this loop diagram which is proportional to p square. Okay, because there is a term proportional to p square in the counter term which can take away any singularity which is present here that is proportional to p square, but there is none. Okay, there is no no term that is proportional to p square. Okay. So there is no such singularity that needs to be cancelled. Okay. See, um, this p square term cannot interfere with this term, okay? Because you keep MR fixed. That's a, a value you have chosen, so you can fix the value of MR, okay? And then p can be varied, right? You can you can uh, look at the two-point function for different values of p. Okay. So changing that p will change the value but this this one will not change so any singularity that is proportional to p square here okay cannot be utilized to cancel something which is independent of p square here okay so uh, we can make the following choice we can choose z phi to be equal to 1 okay so if z phi is equal to 1, this goes away and that is fine. I don't need any 
such term to cancel any poles here. So that's a choice I can make and it's good. Z phi doesn't, so uh, to this order, the field phi is equal to phi, phi r, right? Because we had a, uh, all these z's always start with one. Okay, so to order lambda r phi is same as phi r. Okay, but this will change if you go to second order. Okay, when you have different other diagrams at two loops, this statement will change. But up to order lambda r, phi has uh, remained phi r. Okay, or phi r is same as phi. The normalization has not changed. Okay, now let's let's look at this term. This is proportional to m r square. You have an m r square here, so I can kill this singularity. Okay, so for that I can. Um, choose we can choose um, z phi to be 1 and lambda r there is a issue of factor of i how come yeah because I missed the factor of i here this comes with a this counter vertex as a factor of i. Here, this one, that is what I had missed. Okay, so lambda um, r m r square over thirty two over thirty two pi square. This is this factor. I have see this is common in both the i factor is common in both and I'm now lo now looking at this part uh, mr square minus because you are adding these two up minus so this one gives you half minus half z phi z m square minus one mr square so when you add these two up you get one term which is this and I want this to be finite okay I'm not sp specifying what I what exactly finite number I want to be but I want it to be something finite um, no there's a pole that I have missed this one over epsilon I have missed okay so now if you choose so this is finite so now we can choose zm square to be 1 plus lambda r four pi square. Okay. If I make that choice, let's see what happens. See, z phi is already equal to 1 plus something of order lambda r. Okay, so z phi is, uh, because we are doing everything correct to order lambda r only, I have z equal to 1. So z is 1, okay, and if, if you compare, it's, then the sum of these two should be 0. So z m square should be equal to 1 plus 1 over epsilon lambda r over 4 pi r square, uh, 4 pi square, okay. m square cancels and uh, this factor of half divided from 32 gives you 16, which is, uh, 4 pi square okay 16 times pi, uh, pi square is 4 pi square so that is what you get and if you do this then this makes the sum finite okay so so here is the summary let me write it again Oops. So summary of what we have done is the following. We took this um, 
one loop diagram plus took the counter term and we made this finite okay and to make this finite we have seen that we can take z phi to be 1 plus something at order lambda r square okay so the term which is proportional to lambda r turned out to be 0 so 0 ti times lambda r plus order lambda r square okay so it is really 1 that is z phi is equal to 1 okay it's a it's a very special thing that has happened that the lambda r term is vanishing okay it will not be true in general but in some in some cases certain terms might just vanish okay for for whatever reasons but they can vanish okay it, it's not necessary that each term has to be non zero okay so z phi is 1 plus order lambda r square and uh, zm square i have found that it should be 1 plus 1 over epsilon lambda r over 16 pi square okay plus order lambda r square so if I make these choices, make this plus this finite. Okay, now you see, um, you can take epsilon going to infinity limit. Because when you take epsilon going to infinity limit, these um, z's they become infinite you see this z phi didn't become doesn't become at one loop because this is zero but in principle uh, if you were to calculate two order lambda r square and other terms okay they will diverge okay but uh, and also zm has diverged so what has happened is that the bare mass see bare mass m which was written in terms of the renormalized mass as zm times mr okay this has become singular the bare mass is singular or infinite in epsilon going to zero limit okay because zm becomes infinite but mr is uh, M, sorry zm becomes infinite but mr is something finite we have fixed mr we have said okay mr takes some finite value whatever value you wish to choose okay the cost of making mr finite is that the bare parameter becomes infinite because zm is finite but i am fine with that because if i look at this sum which is what really enters into the calculation of physical mass which is something observable okay that is finite so I'm going to get finite results for um, uh, physical observables, but the bare parameters and bare fields are going to become infinite. So your action or Lagrangian density is going to become infinite, but you're still going to get finite results. Okay, so this is what is uh, the renormalization program. We make the bare quantities which are unphysical, non-observable objects we make them infinite and we still get predictive power because the observables become finite because they are expressed not in terms of bare parameters and bare fields and uh, uh, not in terms of bare parameters mr and lambda r but they are expressed in terms of finite parameters lambda r and mr but remember these are also not physical observables lambda r and mr Physical observable is something like physical mass, M, MP, okay? That can be expressed in lambda R and MR. Let me show you um, exactly uh, what you'll get if you calculate the physical mass, okay? But before that, let me make these remarks. So, in epsilon going to zero limit, that is D equal to four, four dimensions your physical world okay the bare coupling constant okay in this case you are just seeing zm so let me make statement only about that the bare mass parameter m becomes infinite okay which means that 
your Lagrangian density density also becomes infinite. Okay. But still we get finite physical mass. Okay. So um, this is nice. Let's see how to get the physical mass. It's almost there. So we want to get physical mass correct up to order lambda r. Remember we are doing perturbation theory. So you will be able to calculate observables up to some fixed order in the, the coupling constant which is your expansion parameter. So what do you get? You get the following. Um, this loop diagram plus the counter term after cancelling everything is i over p square minus m square plus i epsilon square. This is coming from the two, two external legs okay. times the remaining part which is i um, um, lambda r over 32 pi square okay 32 pi r square pi square then m r square times 1 plus log of mu square over m r square plus log of 4 pi minus Euler gamma plus order lambda r square terms. So I'll drop them or maybe just write it like this. Okay, that's your finite result for this object, this sum. So how do you get the physical mass? We have seen earlier that we should look at the pole of the two point function and this has the form I times the residue Okay, divided by, um, okay, I should have first drawn the diagrams. So this is um, this propagator, the lowest order contribution plus all 1PI diagrams. Okay, one particle irreducible, you remember this. We have discussed about this earlier. Okay, plus It has stopped working now. I'm finding it difficult to write. Okay. So this and of course all other such um, diagrams. And here this um, is equal to, how should I write? Where this one particle irreducible this doesn't contain the legs, okay? Let, let me put these vertical arrows to uh, uh, say that you don't have to include these propagators, okay? These are, these are amputated ones. So for amputated uh, object, I will write this or, or simply even I can remove that. We had defined this earlier as minus i sigma p square. Okay, it will be a function of the scalar p square and with this it becomes i times the residue over p square minus m r square minus sigma of p square. Okay, it also depends on m r square and of course lambda plus epsilon. 
and of course other terms which are that's the structure uh, uh, which are not singular um, okay so that's the um, uh, two point function and what you have here is really um, this object right one pi so this sum is one pi up to order lambda r so this one pi up to order lambda r is i times see, uh, if i remove the propagators meaning i remove the these two these square then whatever is left is i sigma okay so uh, this is um how should i write okay i sigma so because there is a factor of i already so whatever is left here is sigma so sigma is sigma p square up to order lambda square is 1 uh, no lambda r mr square over 32 pi square times 1 plus log of mu square over mr square plus log of 4 pi minus order gamma okay this is correct up to order lambda so you see what the physical mass is physical mass is mp is equal to um or mp square is equal to mr square see this is the pole right this is the physical mass Okay, M R um, okay maybe i will stop here it is becoming difficult to write so um, you can calculate the physical mass here okay and we have the finite result and you see that the result depends on mu as i was saying earlier that the result will depend on mu even though you know that it should not okay but that's an artifact of doing a perturbation theory because you have stopped at some order there is a mu dependence and then you also get these constants okay so these are also part of your result these are all order lambda r terms but here um maybe i'll tell more in the next video but i'll just say in words instead of writing um oh yeah here yes here when we were subtracting infinities we were choosing what the value of zm should be okay we chose to subtract only the pole terms okay we chose zm such that only 1 over epsilon gets removed okay because that did the job of making the sum finite but to get a finite result you have freedom to also subtract some finite pieces right so in addition to this 1 over epsilon if you were to remove the log 4 pi and this gamma minus gamma uh, euler gamma also you still get a finite result and you have that freedom right no one can say can tell you that you are not allowed to subtract this okay you are allowed to because that's that subtract that additional subtraction is also going to give you a finite result okay this is uh, what is called a renormalization scheme okay how much finite pieces you subtract is a particular choice of a scheme okay i will write in these things in next video because my pen is not writing now and uh, we'll talk about um, a little more about these things in the in the next video